forsaken, gather us in the blind and the lame. All right, let's do this. Welcome, ladies and gentlemen, back to another edition of the Uber Farmer Cigar Garage Talks. <coughs> How's everyone doing? I'm doing great. Hoping you're ready for this new series. I sure enough am. What are we smoking? What are we drinking before we get too far into the series? Ladies and gentlemen, they're back. The Warfighter. This is their 556. Five, um, do a little cigar. And special edition. Some homemade wine. Uh, if you notice from the thumbnail picture, I tried to make my own bad motivator barrel. Um, I like to experiment with stuff like that. Try it out and whatnot. Anyway, moral of the story, uh, my barrel's are nowhere his quality. I had some leftover wine. Uh, Cordell grapes, Concord grapes, I believe these are. One of the local farmers, I know, ooh, that oxidized some. To be expected, it's been sitting in my fridge since around noon. <clears throat> Not the best place to get it's oxidized, but it's fine. It's still actually very tasty. Um, one of the local farmers, we did a little wheeling and dealing and trading. He wanted some homemade wine, um, and he got a bunch of extra grapes. So we, we did a little trade. Well, the title of the video probably gave it away, folks, but just in case you were curious at all, in honor of smoking the Warfighter cigars, um, since I got a sampler pack of them, we are bringing back the war stories, ladies and gentlemen. You love to hear it, right? Uh, God bless it. I love war stories. One of my favorite teaching tools. Uh, but I figured in, in honor of smoking the war fighters, we'd bring back the war stories. I haven't done these in quite a while. Uh, I've been itching to get back to telling some of the war stories. Uh, again, some might be mine, some might not. Some might be completely made up. Most will be embellished because that's just what a good war story is. Um, there's always nuggets of truth and information in there for you. But whoever tells them, just remember... Uh, take with a grain of salt. Uh, I'll probably end up repeating some of the war stories I've said in the past, so if this is a repeat, um, those of you who know me will say, yeah, that's perfect, because I like to repeat my stories, my war stories, especially when teaching or talking to patients or whatever it might be. Um, <clears throat> just as a quick disclaimer, there will be dark humor. In these videos, this video series will have quite a bit of dark humor. You might hear me laugh at what you might feel is inappropriate. Um, I'll put a little reference up there to the video I did about dark humor. Uh, it really is something that, as an EMS provider, a medical professional, public servant, dark humor is what keeps us going. Uh, if we can't compartmentalize, if we can't reframe the horrors we see um, on a almost daily basis on these shifts, sometimes hourly basis, you go crazy. Um, I do a much better job explaining that video. Go ahead and check it out. Uh, but just be warned, there will be dark humor. I don't know, maybe I should put a dark humor warning in front of these, a little trigger warning, if you will. Um, but anyway, enough of that formality stuff. Let's get into the war stories. So I actually put out a poll on Facebook, a little post asking people for their favorite war stories that I'd share with them. Because um, again, I use them as teaching tools. I use them as uh, examples. And I use them just to pass the time and kind of flate my ego a little bit. Um, I get to check that Facebook post. That's my bad. It was kind of a busy day. I posted it. Got everything set up, turned the camera on, realized I forgot to look. Look it up, but that's okay. I got a ton of war stories I'm willing to share. You're welcome. Uh, let's go with one that actually didn't happen to me. This happened to uh, one of the neighboring ambulances. Um, 
Well, okay, it kind of happened to me. I'm the guy who did the whole rent a medic thing, um, where they come in and they uh, you know need some additional assistance. So what happened was is they are doing a a freighter um, has a patient uh, who is having a what they believe to be a mitocardio event going on. And if you've never asked yourself, well, hey, if someone gets sick on a boat, what happens? Well, they find the nearest port. You radio in 911, and then we somehow have to get you from the boat to shore, or from your boat to another boat to shore to the ambulance. All right, well, this one ambulance company, um, which I have a lot of respect for, they have to actually do this two to six times a year. They gotta get someone off a boat. Well, here's this person um, having a cardiac event, and uh, lo and behold, the boat is actually an international boat. Uh, so you can say dispatch tells them that, you know, they're having some difficulty communicating with the crew. The Coast Guard is actually en route to try and help do what's called a pick, where they get a person off these freighters, because it's not like you can just pull up to a dock in a lot of these situations. It has to be done on the fly. Because um, it's not like just any dock can support a, you know, couple hundred foot or couple hundred yard or whatever are freighters. Um, they're enormous ships. Uh, if you've ever seen them, uh, they're breathtaking. They're amazing. So anyway, uh, Coast Guard goes to the dock where the ambulance is parked. Uh, they pick up an EMT and... Uh, uh, I believe just the EMT, just one of them went to kind of do the the warm handoff. Um, so they rush him out there, and uh, they're trying to explain to them that all they need to do is the Coast Guard wanted them to lower a line, and they would attach a harness that the guy would be hooked into. Uh, then they lower him on this harness, and uh, pick would be done. I'm talking to the the guy who uh, who has done this more than once. He says it's usually a pretty smooth process. Some ships have lower doors that make it easier. This one didn't. Uh, lost in translation. I mean, everything's are going over radios or trying to go through interpreters. Meanwhile, this person is actively dying from what appears to be a heart attack. And they're trying everything they can. They're trying to show them, put on the harness, point at the rope to try and you know, send the rope down. They're, they're talking through the radio, going through dispatch. Dispatch is talking to a uh, interpreter. Uh, also, the interpreter says, uh, the crew wants you to stand by um, and be ready to receive the patient. And again, I wish I could have been here for this. This sounds like the awesomest thing in the world. Uh, I was about, I believe, 20, 30 minutes out. Um, usually when it's a pick off a boat, we don't have to usually rush to get there because normally it takes quite an effort. And I think they even waited to call us, perhaps. Well, what they did is dress the guy up in a Mustang suit. Um, in case you don't know, that's if you're going to go into ice water. Um, it's also called a Gumby suit or a cold water immersion suit or a dry suit, if you will. Um, they see him getting him in this suit. And like, okay, well, those usually have hooks and harnesses, but, you know, the Coast Guard was saying they're... They're not comfortable lowering him on the you know, Mustang suit they haven't inspected. Uh, they see the guy hang on to the rope. Uh, like, okay, well, he must. they're probably going to lower him off this crane. And the next thing you know, the guy lets go. Um, dropping, I, I mean, the, the estimate changes from 20 feet to 40 feet up in the air. Drops off the boat. Sploosh. Into the water he goes. Um... And uh, he bobs up. Uh, the Coast Guard, of course, maneuvers their boat to pick him up. They wave to him and go back to the job and actually take off before the guy is even fully on the boat. I guess they wanted to keep their schedule. Um, so <laughs> I didn't know any of this, really. I'm, I'm here picking up this guy who doesn't speak English, um, trying to, to treat him and whatnot, and... Um, everyone's just a little kind of dumbfounded. They don't know what to say. Um, I didn't know that this had happened. It wasn't until 
much later when they asked me, well, what do we do? Do we report this, that they basically threw the guy off a ship to get him? Um, I'm just cackling here in this story. I mean, what do you do? Um, he wasn't injured. It, uh, clearly, the guy apparently, they said, had good form. The Coast Guard said he had good form going in, so he knew how to jump off of this boat. They said they are trained on how to do that. Um, so we didn't have to backboard him or anything like that. Uh, and I mean, I the guy got in, he was fine, not injured, not battered. Uh, you know, they fixed his heart attack, shipped him off to a hospital um, to actually have some cats put in. The guy lived. Well, of course, the armchair doctors and armchair medics of the world had to tear this call apart. Um, they need more training, more equipment, more this, more that. Uh, when really, I mean, there was not much they could do. There was a language barrier. There was an understanding barrier, a cultural barrier. Um, you know, plus you're on the seas. So um, it kind of eventually blew over. Some people got their fingers slapped. I think I got my fingers slapped too. But I was honest. I said, you know, I, I didn't know the guy had, had jumped off the boat until after I got here. Thankfully, the Coast Guard really came out to bat for this crew. Um, they did work well with this ambulance crew. And the commander of the Coast Guard uh, rescue station actually kind of laid down the law and said, no, it was a perfect landing, you know, nothing to, to worry about. He vouches for his guys, he vouches for the EMS. Um, and when you kind of throw a Fed in there, a federal government person, especially a military member with some stars and bars and eagles and whatever he had on his chest, the case went away. Um, still an interesting situation. You know, that's something you don't think of in EMS. Doing a pick off of a boat. Getting a, a sailor off of a ship. Um, that's stuff you don't really uh, think you'd ever have to do. It's not, definitely nothing we ever trained for in class. Um, although I'm trying to convince the guy to do a class on how to get someone off of a boat. How does that work? Guy is uh, hesitant. We'll still work on it. We'll see what happens. There you go. Kicking it off. EMS war story. How to get him off the boat. Um, like I said, luckily the guy turned out just fine. Good teachable moment. We talk about that, how things can change on a dime, and you got to kind of roll with the punches in EMS. You got to be creative. Um, and you do the best you can with what you got. But anyway, folks, I'm going to go finish my warfighter cigar, drink some of my delicious wine. Um, and uh, go check my Facebook. Go see what other war stories you guys want me to share, want me to talk about. <clears throat> It'll be good times, good times. So anyway, I hope everyone's staying safe out there. And we'll see you on the next one.